Hey everybody, what's going on? This is uh, Mike Lant with the Helix Real Reviews. This is the first of its kind. It's uh, I don't really know where we're going to go with this, but I just decided I want to start doing movie reviews because I just got tired of listening to so many other critics do it and just approach it from, you know, whatever perspective they have, Ivy League school, BS, whatever. Obviously, I don't have any of that, nor do I deserve any of that. Um, my So the approach that we're kind of going to do it from is sort of like a filmmaking perspective. Um, whatever I'm going to review, I'm just going to you know, do my take. It's probably going to suck. And I understand I'm probably going to get a lot of heat afterwards, but that's what I expect. So that's uh, that's why I'm here doing this. And, um, yeah, so it's just me here alone in a hotel room right now trying to figure out what the best way to start this off. I don't like, all right, so, okay, listen, my idea was, is that I listen to a lot of critics do podcasts about movies or whatever, and they approach it from, like I said, the Ivy League perspective, and that's all well and good, but I think there's other things that they don't seem to appreciate or that they should that I think regular people do when they see movies. So I'm basically going to be the voices of people. They nominated me. I'm going to take it and we're going to run with it. And that's just how it's going to be. Um, yeah. So the first movie in the Helix Reel reviews, the first one of 2013 is Zero Dark Thirty. We're spending billions of dollars. We are still no closer to defeating our enemy. 20 detainees recognize that photo. No birth certificate, no cell phone. You guys are ghosts. He's right in the inner circle. The whole world's gonna win in on this. I want targets. Where was the last time you saw Bin Laden? Oh my god, is that what I think it is? Where was the last time you saw Bin Laden? Yeah, that's just a little bit of the trailer there. That was pretty good, eh? I just want to talk about, first of all, I want to say how fucking awesome that trailer is. Like, that trailer, it just, the sound effects and the music, for instance, were spectacular. Like, that, they had that Inception style, like, thing or whatever. And I'm going to touch on this at some point, but I think that's exactly what was missing from the movie itself. Like, that trailer might have been a little bit better than the movie. And don't get me wrong, I love the movie. I think the movie's incredible, and I'm going to go into it, um, you know, what I like about it in a minute. But that trailer just sets up uh, how intense you think the movie is going to be about what's going on. And I think there is some legitimate tension. And I mean, I, I'm just looking at it from my end, so people have agreed or disagreed with me about it, so I understand um, all right, first, let's start Let's start talking about the director, Catherine Bigelow. First of all, she might be the hottest director ever in the history of cinema. Like, I think directors have mainly been men, I think, up until maybe the last 10 years or 10, 15 years. Like, I don't remember. Um, yeah, I don't think there's been a woman that's directed a movie, you know, that's come out in movie theaters and been a big hit or anything and... Yeah, I don't remember seeing any as a kid. There's none that are coming off the top of my head. Um, so yes, smoking hot, and she was obviously the ex-wife of James Cameron. So I don't know if they had some sort of exchange there. Like James Cameron's movies, obviously, are amazing. In my opinion, they've gone. I I mean, I loved Avatar, but it, it doesn't hold up on repeated viewings. Like the CG just gets worse and worse every time you see it. You're like, what? They already made it look better better than that last year and this like took five years to get where they are. and maybe his movie helped push it further i don't know 
But um, anyway, where was it going with that? Oh, yeah, so they were married, but that's not relevant to what I'm talking about. Um, so, yeah, I want to talk about for a second the inherent difference I think men and female have when it comes to storytelling. Because I think this has been something that's been debated many times. And it goes, and I think men and women come up against this many times with uh, entertainment, for instance, acting, uh, singing, directing, obviously, and uh, all that stuff. Because, you know, men seem to get better roles in movies, but there's a lot more female actors out there. And if you've ever done a casting session, you'll find that you you won't find it'll take it'll be hard to find a good male actor, but and then you'll get ten amazing actresses for one like a small role. So, um, where was I going with this? Oh yeah, so back to storytelling. So here's the thing. I think the reason that there hasn't been a lot of female directors, I, obviously there's some chauvinistness going on in Hollywood, like there is in any other industry on in the world but i think the issue that comes with directing is that women aren't inherently groomed to be good storytellers from a young age and i mean i that's gonna come off crazy sexist and obviously it doesn't apply to everybody i know guys that tell shit stories that ramble on forever i don't actually but at the same time and i know women that you know will captivate me with one sentence but I think culturally, women, when they're being raised, they're not really taught to focus on a story in terms of plot. Like, for instance, women feed off of emotion. Um, and anyone will tell you that if you have to go on a date with somebody or whatever, you know, they're, they say, all right, get them to open up about themselves and use emotion to do that. When women talk to each other, it's all about how they felt during the day. And the story could be about whatever, but the plot isn't important whenever they're repeating it. It's not what happened. It's how they felt and what you know whether or not they felt angry or this or that afterwards. And this plays out perfectly in terms of the reality show revolution that's going on where TV cameras are falling around the most unimportant, uninteresting people. But women are responding to them because there's emotion there, you know, and I'm talking, you know, like the real housewives and the bachelorette, uh, the bachelorette and all that, you know, all it is is emotion. There's no story in any of those things. Like it's, there's nothing interesting. There's barely any crazy twist where you go, wow, what that happened? Like it's literally just emotion after emotion and same with, um, you know, fashion, that that's usually a female-dominated world because fashion is about emotion. There's, not, there's no purpose to dress like this. It's all about how it makes you feel, whether or not uh, how it makes you feel when you're wearing it or when you're looking at it. If it makes you go, ugh, or, ooh, that's nice, you know, that's, that's where women's core... And I'm obviously I'm generalizing. Not all women are like this, and you know, and there are some men that are like this as well. I I'm just saying this. I believe that's why there haven't been a lot of women directors. I don't feel that they probably the majority of them have a desire to story tell, you know, in a way, you know, in a way that's plot driven. Like most movies are plot driven. You'll get the occasional. Um, you know, you'll get indie films which are more character driven and more emotionally driven, which, you know, are great. And you'll find coincidentally in those worlds, there's a lot more female directors. Plot driven movies are usually a male dominated world. Um, men tell stories very, like we just generally every day say less words than women. That's, you know, a stat. And, uh, so our stories are succinct and they're tighter, but you know, emotion varies from film to film. The reason I went on this whole huge stupid rant about Catherine Bigelow and emotion with women and blah, blah, is because I felt that Zero Dark Thirty actually had a very guy feeling, direction to it. Um, she, you know, obviously she did The Hurt Locker, and I felt the same way about that. Um, I wasn't actually even as drawn into The Hurt Locker as some people. You know, obviously people have different opinions about that. But The Hurt Locker, 
uh, was very. I don't know. I, I I haven't seen it, so I haven't seen it in a while, so I can. Uh, I actually fell asleep when I saw it, but I remember it was because I wasn't being drawn in. I I Zero Dark Thirty. I was drawn in a lot more to this movie, um, but at the same time, I felt it was guarded from really pulling me in. And a couple of things that she did to kind of emphasize that was music choices. Like there was there was a lot of silence. Um, when stuff would be happening. And then the music... See, like I said in the trailer, the trailer was very visceral with its music and its sound effects. And in the movie, there wasn't as much of that. But the sharp dialogue and the you know the quick pace of the whole movie made it work the other way. Um, so yeah, it's, I felt that the emphasis on plot... Because there's the whole story. All right, the whole story about Jessica Chastain's character um, named Maya. Now I tried to look up if this Maya girl. Obviously she's real, but um, actually uh, people would know better about that. But anyway, it's the plot to get Bin Laden, and it goes through this, you know, decade-long search for him that a lot of us didn't really know a lot about. Obviously, we just kind of woke up one morning and Osama Bin Laden was dead. That was just it. And we remembered that, you know, we were told that he took responsibility for 9-11, um, you know, which is the greatest terrorist act that's ever been committed and greatest single act of terrorism ever that's ever been committed, at least uh, on North America. I don't know if that's true across the world. I don't, I don't think it is, but I don't know if Rwanda takes a cake for that. But, um, ooh, I got a text. All right. So, anyway, um... Where am I going with this? So yeah, the story follows Jessica Chastain's character as she hunts for Bin Laden through the CIA gathering intelligence. And the first half of the movie actually focuses a lot on the enhanced ter interrogation techniques that were used with some of the prisoners that they took. Um, and it's very, you're very conflicted because you don't know is it working or is it not working? Like, what am I watching? Am, am I watching them be successful with this? Or are they, yeah, like, are they being successful? Or are we just seeing it play out and it doesn't really get the results that it should be? It's interesting because we only really see maybe like three different people get interrogated so and one gives information one doesn't you know one gives information without even being um tortured but because he had been tortured in the past and he doesn't want to go through it anymore and i thought that was an interesting idea like i said that's the main thing that this movie has come under heat for the controversy of whether or not those enhanced interrogation techniques worked uh, you can draw your own conclusions. They show both sides. They show a lead of someone that they tortured that led them nowhere. And then they also showed, you know, they basically, uh, the man, obviously, that I just mentioned that had been tortured and doesn't want to be tortured anymore. And he gives up the information about Osama bin Laden's courier. They make it seem like, you know, on some level, the torture did work, you know. It can be debated. I always think when, especially when this came up, uh, when they were presenting this idea, and even I remember thinking this back in the day when nine after nine eleven happened and all this stuff was going down. I remember thinking of that scene from Reservoir Dogs with uh, Chris Penn where he yells at the guy. He goes, "If you punch him enough, he's gonna take." What does he say? If he punches, <laughs> if you punch his face enough, he'll take blame for the fucking Chicago fire. And that's how you know. And that's something that interrogation like that produces and it can be d oh wow that's a, this is a very nice um sunset just out my window i'm in like the shitty not not a shitty hotel but just not the nicest hotel um yeah so that that can be debated and i think this movie tries to present that debate but without really taking a side either way um maybe a little People will argue with me, but I think it does glorify the torture scenes a little bit. But, I mean, I don't know. I don't really know where she wanted to land on that. And by she, I mean Catherine Bigelow. 
Um, but yeah, so, um, so yeah, the movie is three, is almost three hours long. I think it's two hours and 45 minutes and it doesn't feel like it's a very brisk two hours and 45 minutes. Um, I think so many movies have come out lately that have been around that mark. I I remember because I keep coming out of them so late. I'm just like, all right, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's just the key for Oscar season type movies, but and there's been a lot of good movies lately too. A lot of good stuff out there. So yeah, it's it doesn't feel like two hours and forty five minutes. It's great. Um, the acting is good. The writing's good. Uh, you feel this is probably exactly how it happened. Um, like I said, it goes back to just some filmmaking things. I felt that there just there were some good scenes, but. I didn't know what to make of Jessica Chastain's character. And not to say that she didn't do a great job. She did an amazing job. But just the story itself, I didn't know much about her. And we would find out little bits and pieces. And then again, at the same time, do you need to know much about her? Who knows? You know, it's like that American gangster situation. It's like, did I really need to know that much about Russell Crowe? Can we just kept this on Denzel? But, you know, arguments can be made. Um, but... For instance, Paul Greengrass, who I don't think gets enough praise out there, he made a 9-11 movie as well, United 93, um, which might be the most visceral movie that's ever been made. Um, if you haven't seen it, I recommend you go out and just you endure it. It's not going to be a pleasant filmmaking experience, but it's something to see and experience. Um, and he made a movie called The Green Zone, which I think it was about the Iraq War. and It was very Hollywood, like, clean cut nicely put together movie but a part of me feels like he might have been a better choice he just has such a such a hold on tension and great choices in music and all that sort of stuff and uh, I feel like he, he would have done the exact same stuff with this material except give it that a little more emotional push um and I, I feel like a main thing that could have done that was music. Um, I mean, music's, music's amazing in so many movies, you know. Music really makes some movies for you. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll like the dumbest, the people that think of the dumbest music, like the Transformers. All, all the Batman movies have had amazing soundtracks, in my opinion. I don't know why these things never win or never even get nominated for best original scores but movie movies like that which have amazing uh scores and loud scores i love oh, i love that shit and it might it might feel weird for a realistic movie but i would always point the finger at michael mann i don't know if you've seen any of his movies and i'm asking i have no idea who i'm even asking this i don't know who's listening to this four people one person a thousand probably nobody probably just me listening to it over again being like shut shut your mouth all right anyway Talking about Michael Mann, he does... See, I'm a big fan of realistic style movies. Movies that, you know, the acting feels real, the dialogue feels real. You know, they're not going for over-the-top type of uh, Michael Bay shit. And Michael Mann does a lot of that stuff. He hasn't... His last few movies have been kind of wonky, but um, him and his heyday, the music choices that he would make just... And they'd be random songs that you're like, I, I feel like I knew that this existed, but I'm so glad he just threw it in there for that moment. Like, just finds the absolute perfect song for the perfect moment. And like I said, I feel like Catherine Bigelow could have done that with this, but didn't. Maybe she wanted to keep it more realistic. I get it. But for me, it's what kept the movie a little bit away from me. Um... So yeah, I was talking about those enhanced interrogation scenes. I just I want to talk about this one actor, Jason Clark, who uh, I discovered. Um, I think it was a Michael Mann movie. It was uh, Public Enemies. He was like uh, John Dillinger's right hand guy. I forget the name of him, but yeah, Jason Clark, fan fucking tastic actor. Just I don't know what it is about this guy, but I'm drawn into every bit of dialogue that he says. He didn't really get a chance to shine in Public Enemies, but. There was a show that only lasted for one season called The Chicago Code. Now, I don't even watch that many cop shows, but this was just, it was like 24, but as a cop show. I don't, I don't know. I couldn't describe it. 
he was the main actor in it and he owned every single scene he had he would do interrogation scenes he would do this and that maybe that's why Bigelow chose him for um for this because he was the main interrogator and he I've heard this been said before he's not your typical interrogator he's you know he's a messy looking dude he he looks like the average American dude which is you know hilariously ironic because he's Australian but yeah he was a great great casting choice and I think this is going to be a big break for him I know that the movie's doing really well oh, I'm just going to pull up on Rotten Tomatoes and see how much it made this week I'm th this is Wednesday from the Friday that it opened so yeah 24.4 Mill, yeah, I guess that's pretty good. Um, yeah, that's a that's a pretty good opening. I think a lot of people are gonna see this. A lot of people are gonna like it. Um, yeah, so great choice. Uh, he didn't, you know, he would appear in and out of the movie as it went along. You know, as the decade long story unfolded. But yeah, great actor, and I hope to see more from him. Um, and it's funny too because a lot of the most of the stars in this movie are from TV TV fame. You know, there's Friday Night Lights, the coach I forget his name from that, uh, the dude from Parks and Recreation, who was one of the SEAL Team Six guy. And it was weird because he just he was kind of doing his spiel, his shtick, as SEAL Team Six, like in a realistic, believable way. But it was still like, oh, so he's, you know. Because you're like, oh, he's in this Catherine Bigelow movie. He's going to be dramatic and we're going to see something different. It's like, no, you just, you know. It's like when Ryan Reynolds pulls up in most movies. You're like, all right, he's going to do his Ryan Reynolds thing. But uh, the leader of the SEAL Team 6, dude, uh, Joel Ed Edgerton, um, fucking awesome actor. He was in uh, the Timothy Bean movie. What, the Curious Case of Timothy Green? Is that it? No, I'm probably getting that wrong. Anyway, he was in that, and uh, he was also in probably maybe the best sports movie, in my opinion, that has been made in some recent time. He was one of the MMA fighters of uh, the movie Warrior, and he was brothers with Tom Hardy, and I'm not going to give away how the end goes, but it's that might be one of the best movies of the year, easily. I, I don't know if it came out this year or the year before. <laughs> anyway, so... He was great, and if you want to check him out in an even more meteor role and in a really visceral movie, I would definitely recommend see Joel Edgerton in Warrior. Um, speaking of the SEAL Team 6 in this movie, I, I actually learned that they can't divulge who the actual person was that shot Bin Laden. And spoiler alert, spoiler, Osama Bin Laden dies at the end of this. I'm sorry. I know some of you didn't. And I'm going to go on a tangent about that. Isn't it fucked up that Catherine Bigelow can throw together a movie? Okay, because here was the situation. I don't know how many people knew this, but Catherine Bigelow and her writer, I'll pull him up real quick, uh, they had a script ready about the search for Bin Laden. Um, and they, they had this script that they were going to, produce and all of that they tabled it scrapped it completely or no well they didn't scrap it but they put it in a drawer somewhere maybe her sock drawer i don't know where she keeps her uh scripts that she's not using put it away and wrote this since the may 1st assassination i assume that i probably took about a month before they started to get going on something new so what is it we're in 2013 yeah so in about a year and a half she had a completely new movie and with obviously a way more intense ending than I don't know what her plan was with the first one, with the first script but I'm just saying it's annoying that she was able to actually come up with something that's now Oscar bait by accident if this hadn't happened who knows what kind of movie she would have ended up with maybe it would have been better maybe it would have been worse who knows maybe she'll still make that movie someday I don't know but I'm just saying it's infuriating that <laughs> she was so talented that she was able to completely scratch something, make something new, and now it's Oscar, you know, it's up for best picture. Um, you know, and I, I obviously I won't go too much into the ending uh, with the SEAL Team 6 raid, 
uh, it was very, it was very, very well done. Probably the best part of the whole movie. Um, and it's just, and it's unbroken. You know what I mean? You, they were, they're flying in, they land, they do the business and then they, you know, and the stuff that falls after and then they fly out and it's just crazy how intense that whole moment was. And there's no music. It's very, it's very documentary style. It's very straightforward. Um, you know, prob probably would made it better. Maybe some music would have helped. Um, the way they shot it, apparently very, f you know, pretty factually accurate. Um, there was a little bit with they had to deal with some neighbors nearby coming out and potentially causing problems. And uh, I think when I read somewhere that that kind of happened, but it was only like a couple of dudes and they weren't really, it wasn't really an issue. Um, but yeah, so overall, when, you know, obviously you know what happens. And when that happens, there's not, there's not a lot of emotion there. You're not, you don't know how to feel. Because, I mean, there's kids and stuff in there and, you know, they essentially gun them down, which, you know, is, I assume how it happened. Um, they can't, they can never really say who did it because he'll be a target. And I think, you know, I don't know, I think they had to change names of a lot of people uh, to protect the innocent. But, uh, yeah, um... Yeah, it was a, it was an interesting moment, and it was done very much exactly probably how it went. But yeah, and then the only emotional payoff is probably the very end of the movie, and I'm not going to give away what happens. But there's uh, Jessica Chastain just does something, and you're like, and it all sinks in of you know what it meant to do what we did, or we yeah, like I'm really part of SEAL Team Six. I couldn't climb over a fucking five foot wall if there was if they had the pond on fire below me or something. Um, anyway, yeah. So she, uh, yeah. There's a really cathartic moment at the end of it that you know makes you think about what we've done, and it's hard. You know, you you think about it too. You go, all right. Well, they did this thing in '11, but you know. We never tried them for it or anything, and then we just drop into his house and we're like just knocking down the door. There's kids and wives and shit in there, and you know we're just gunning them down. And it's it's a conflicting thing to feel and to feel good about it, but then you remember that, you know. And that was one thing I liked about the movie is that it showed. 9-11 wasn't just it, you know, there was the London bombing, there was the Marriott bombing, um, there was the CIA bombing on the base, like, these guys fucked up a lot of people, I'm not saying, you know, we, this is a whole other debate of whether or not we deserve to do what we've done and all that shit, but, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting feeling that you come away with, um, I think the number one movie to compare it to, which is what it's going to be going up against at the Oscars, is Argo. Now, the thing about Argo, I liked Argo a lot, but I liked Argo before I knew what actually happened. Because um, I went into it, I I'd heard the story about it. I didn't really know exactly how it went, it went down, but um, I went in there with like, you know, a medium amount of knowledge. Medium amount isn't a measure of anything but uh, uh, the, if it, uh i knew about 30 percent of what i needed to know so when i went into it i had a really good time i enjoyed the movie i was you know there were some tense moments um there's a lot of moments where i was just like if this really happened this is insane and i think i i can't really give away that movie either because i know it's been out for like a month but i can't really give it away but there's just some moments i was like this is incredible. And then afterwards, you go by, you go read what actually happened. You're like, oh, that didn't happen at all. So that's just Hollywood bullshit. <laughs> and there was a lot of Hollywood tweaking and bullshit. Like, there's a lot of stuff you're like, all right, I get that they needed to have this and that to make the movie what it was. But the reason I bring it up is uh, it goes back to what I was saying about emotional storytelling. Uh, Argo tweaked its story in order to 
juice up the emotion. Whereas Bigelow, I kind of, kind of felt wanted just wanted to be accurate. Like pretty much just wanted to make a documentary. Um, not even like a, not even like a fun documentary like Morgan Spurlock, you know, with all the silly graphics and I yeah, documentaries are not straightforward at all. They do a lot of emotional tweaking, but yeah, she just wanted to do this straightforward like you know, no bullshit type of take on the thing. And like I said, that's admirable and it's interest it's an interesting choice. Was it the right one? Who knows? Um and the reason I say that is she was accurate, Argo was not. Argo did a lot of fucked up the story in a lot of ways. And uh just, you know, go check it out online and see for yourself. But um what he did make was a viscerally emotionally satisfying movie. Um, you felt a lot of what was going on, whether that was music, you felt the tension of a lot of situations, um, you know, where they could have been found out. And that was, that made it great. Uh, the sta- he upped the stakes. You know, after, it was kind of weird because after 9-11, the stakes weren't really there to do something. There was no imminent danger with Osama bin Laden. Now that I think about it, like, they found out where he was, and then it was just like, all right, well, let's just go get him. And then, you know, I'm not spoiling anything. You you obviously knew that. Um, but, yeah, so it's going to be interesting at the Oscars because right now Argo's sweeping up. I think it won some SAG Awards. And the Golden Globes were just on Sunday, and it won Best Picture. Uh, ben Affleck won Best Director. And it's bullshit, too, because it's it's cuz it's got hollywood stuff in it like those people are such fucking vil- uh there's such zilches for that bullshit like they love like oh well it's about us and it's done you know it's poking fun at us so let's just give it the oscar you know uh the artist won was it last year or two years ago and it was the same bullshit it's just a silent movie that wasn't really i don't know i i didn't see it so but i just know it's about hollywood so I know come Oscar time, it's probably going to it's gonna be interesting. Uh, we'll see what the Academy is going to, um, what they'll value. They may value, you know, uh, factually accurate, emotionally neutral, um, agenda-less Zero Dark Thirty by Catherine Bigelow. Or they might like the juiced up and enter- more entertaining... Argo by Ben Affleck. God, isn't Ben Affleck a good looking dude? Isn't he good? Every time I see him in an interview, he just looks like a good time. Like he looks like a good boss. And he's he's always so nice to everybody. And you just you watch the Golden Globes and you see him and George Clooney go up for best picture. And you're like, what of course. Why not them? Of course it's gonna be them. Why would it be any schmuck? And then on the other end, you have Lena Dunham from Girls who doesn't who Hollywood has never hired to do something like this, and she's sweeping up too. So, you know, maybe they're trying to balance each other out. But anyway, that's all I have to say for that. This has been the first re- Helix Real review. Uh, you may have loved it. You may have hated it. Either way, I want to hear what you think, and I would love to continue the debate online. Um, I don't know how many of these I'm going to do, but it was all right. It was fun. And... Uh, I don't know what the next movie I'm going to see is, but maybe I'll throw it. I just did Zero Dark Thirty because it was the most recent in my memory. Um, Django and Chain is a little... I don't really have a lot to say about that either. It was, it was a good time, but, you know. Anyway, so yeah, this has been Helix Real Review number one. Zero Dark Thirty. I will give this a full recommendation. I feel everyone should see it. It does have, you know, certain problems, certain issues whether they're moral or, uh, you know, moral issues with what's going on. But unfortunately, it's what happens. So it, you're not going to have that issue with the movie. You're just going to have issue with history, uh, unfortunately. And so, yeah. So I would give it a recommendation. Definitely check it out. Get comfortable. It's a, it's a long movie, but it's uh, it goes by pretty fast. And... You'll see some good scenes, and you'll really enjoy. I think you'll you'll come away with a good appreciation for you know what has been accomplished over the past ten years, and in the search for Osama bin Laden, and uh, it was great. 
So yeah, uh, I'm going to leave it at that. This is Michael Lant signing off.